fiction, science fiction, horror, fantasy, crime, LGBT, thriller. You have now entered the house of mystery. With your hosts, Eric Shapiro, David North Martino, John Copenhaver, and Al Warren. One hundred two point three FM Los Angeles. One hundred two point three FM Riverside. And one hundred five zero AM Palm Springs. You are back in the House of Mystery, and I am Al Warren. Yes, the Warren. one and only. And we've got Mister David North Martino back after his vacation. Ah, yes, I am here <laughs> with my full full name. Well, yeah. Well, you're back. Yes. It's the first day from vacation. We have to be polite. You're going to go easy. Gonna courteous. Go easy. I see. And, uh, you know, and, and see how much we really missed you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it wasn't much. Oh, no. <laughs> no, it was a lot. It was a lot. We have to well, have thank that. you. Thank you. Know, you. What else are we going to do? Yeah. The show's just not the show without you. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> yeah. We're not going to get any complaints from Tucker Carlson if you don't. you got to be here. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so it's, a, it's another day. Uh, let's see. Memorial Day is over. Um, we lost Ray Liotta when you were gone. Yes. And that was a surprise. It's shocking. Yeah. yeah. I thought, like I said, I thought he was pretty healthy. I thought he was pretty uh, active, still mm. making shows and movies, and it just sort of was uh, came out of nowhere. Wow. Yeah. It's very surprising. So but young. So how it happens. So young, yeah. He was like, yeah, 67, I think. Wow. Yeah. yeah. That's still young today. Well, it's young because I'm being 60, so I... That's right. <laughs> it's been really be young. young. My God. Anyway. Well, uh, speaking of young, we've got a young author here with us today. And um, so let's let's just bring him in the room. Mr. Rodney Hobson, thank you for coming on the show. It's my pleasure, and I'm pleased to be called young. Young, you're a young buck, just in your just your twenty, young early twenties. I never contradict the host. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's probably better that way. It's like it's like it's like yelling at the judge, right? Mm, yeah. <laughs> um, well, you have an interesting history, so of course you're on the show because you've got these um, detective books you've written these. Uh, interesting books which is great but you've also got a history of doing um things like the book of scams and things like that how does how does a finance guy and you know how to spot fraudster fraudsters and things like that how does a guy like that get into doing detective fiction well they're two completely different things although there are friends of mine who've said to me well we think the stock market's all fiction as well uh, but it, <laughs> uh, but i assure you it isn't um, it is completely different, and one was my job writing finance books and writing finance articles and jobs in financial publications. That was work. And the writing the crime fiction was uh, more, a, more a hobby and something I just did for fun. And, but once you've written the book, you might as well try to get it uh, published. And a publishing company in the UK who... Uh, have got uh, online publishing, uh, decided to take a chance on me. So although I was well known in UK circles in finance writing, I was completely unknown in detective writing. So I was a bit of a chance. Yeah. Did you, did you find that an issue? Was it, was it hard to um, get people to cross over from finance to mystery or is it just a whole new audience? Oh, it's a whole new audience. It's a, it's a completely different audience. Yes, I, I just wasn't writing for the same people. I didn't pretend I was. I mean, if you're going into finance uh, and investments, which is mainly what I've written about, uh, then it's a completely different audience. People are just reading crime for fun, as I wrote it for fun, and people read it for fun, whereas... Stock market investing, you write that as work, 
and people want to make money out of it, so they take it far more seriously. So it's a completely different audience. Well, while, while we're on that, you know, I've got um, significant investments, so what, what should I be doing? <laughs> uh, well, no, it's always difficult to give personal financial advice because... To know what you should be doing, I would need to know all about your inv- your finances. I'd need to know how much money you've got, how much you can afford to lose, what bills you've got to meet every month. I'd need to know what your attitude is to risk. Well, I'm sure you're not going to tell me that on air, and I'd rather you didn't. But to give you proper personal advice, then I would have to know all your personal details. In general terms... To me, you should be investing in stocks and shares. I know the stock market can go down and uh, the, all the Netflix and those kind of stocks, the tech stocks in uh, America uh, listed on the Nasdaq exchange in New York, they've had a pretty torrid time of it just lately. And a lot of share prices I've got overinflated. But on the whole, if you're looking to invest, go for shares that are paying a dividend. It means if the share price falls, at least you've got the dividend compensation. If the share price stays the same, well, you're making money on the dividend. And if the share price goes up, you're winning twice over. This is the only way for me, apart from property, property is the only other thing that gives you a hedge against inflation. It gives you income and it gives you the chance of capital gains. So that, in a nutshell, is my advice. Interesting. Well, I'm just wondering, while we're on this subject, um, when it comes to investing and finance, is there a big difference between like advice or, or what you're right about uh, when it comes to the difference between like the, the UK and the United States? The general principles are all the same. Okay. I mean, I, my first book that was published was a book called Shares Made Simple, which was a beginner's guide to the stock market. And it's very heavily uh, about the London stock market uh, because that's what I knew about and what I got access to information on. But the general principles are all the same. Sometimes the laws are a bit different. The laws are different from from place to place. But if you've got a well-regulated stock market, as we have in London, as you've got in New York, as we have in Europe, uh, then the the general principles are all the same. So now, when we get into your... um detective your fiction your crime books um what was the very first one that you wrote like what was what was the initiating thing that happened that made you uh do a story like what what was it about and who yes it was a book called dead money uh so although we got the money connection it wasn't really about finance at all and i got the idea funny enough from when i lived in singapore We were in Singapore, and the block of flats we were in, uh, there was a law that said that all streets had to be numbered the same, and blocks of flats had to be numbered the same. Every block of flat had to be numbered in the same way, so that the postmen could know where to go, and uh, so there, there was no problems. Now, we meant, in our case that the flat levels were renumbered and we went from floor G to sort of floor six, uh, some, something like that. And I had a pile of posts that went into the letterbox two doors, two floors down and the flat was empty. And I got some important mail that it was too late to act on when it got passed on to me. And I thought, that's an idea I could turn that into a story. Supposing someone is going into a block of flats to murder someone and they don't realize it's been renumbered and they get the wrong flat. Could you make a murder story out of that? And I played around with that and that was the basis of Dead Money. And that's, that's how it all started. So where where do your characters come from in these stories? So you get you you get the idea and you've kind of got what's going on, but how you how do you decide on your characters? Like where do you develop them from? Part of them are on based on people I know, but I'm very careful 
I've only had one example where a character has been entirely on a particular person. Obviously, if you're writing detective stories, most of the characters are either dead or very unpleasant or both. So on the whole, I tend not to put my friends into the books because uh, <laughs> they might take exception to you. It's a good way of losing friends. So I tend to take traits from different people and, and merge them together. So you you draw on people you know, which I think is the best way for anybody to write anything. Draw on people you know, but mix them up a bit so no one person is is a complete real-life person. And so that, that is how I develop them. But I also find that as I write, the characters often develop themselves. Now, I know I'm in control of it, but it is rather like being God. You've created the characters, you've created the world they live in, uh, but you've given them free will. And sometimes they get quite willful and they go from directions I never intended. But the characters, the characters all develop themselves. Uh, and one gets ideas one goes along. I know some writers like to plan everything out in, well in advance, the whole book. I want to have a good idea where the book is going. And I think with detective fiction, it's very important to know who done it. You, you need to know the ending, otherwise you're going to be rumbling around forevermore. But on the whole, I don't develop the books so much before I start writing them, and the characters develop. And I think that's good because real-life people grow into situations, and they react to situations, and their characters can change. So I think if that happens in a book, I think it's a good idea. Well, how do you experience your characters? Do you have an inner monologue in your head? Can you hear them? Um, is, is that how uh, you write your dialogue? I, I don't have any set formula. I, I, I mean, some people, some people do. Every writer is, is different. Every writer follows their own agenda. I try not to have set patterns. I try to just go with with how it goes. And I think, it be I hope it becomes more natural that if you just take things as they go, that's what happens in real life, and that's what I hope happens in my books. So in, in your new, or your latest book, I believe it was, Secret Death, I noticed it's part of the Paul Amos um, mystery yeah. series. Like, um, and it's book six. Um, when you're doing a series like that, um, first of all, do the books each stand alone, or do you have to go through them in order? No, the books all stand alone. Uh, I think the, there may be some slight advantage in taking them in order, and uh, occasionally I do refer back to something else, but very, very little. I think that the trouble is that if you've got people buying the books at random, then... Uh, it does, you don't know which one they pick up first. And so I think that unless it is a clear story, I mean, if you're writing, say, a family saga, all right, the family would go on from generation to generation. But if you're doing detective story, stories, each story is complete in itself, and I think you must be able to read it in itself because your, your reader... You can't say to the reader, you've picked up book three, but you've got to read book one and two first. That's, that's not how it works. So the, the, the books have to stand alone, in, in my view, and they, and they all do. Uh, do you have the series outlined? Are you, are you the type of author that um, you kind of know um, how it's going to begin and how it's going to end, and you write the books in the series as it goes? Or is this all just by the seat of your pants? Uh, I'm not sure whether I'm going to go with the phrase seat of your pants, but maybe it is. <laughs> I believe it is anyway. I, I, when I started writing the book, I had a vague idea for another couple. And I found that each time I write a book, I'm developing an idea for another one in my mind. And so although I concentrate on that book, I've always got the next one forming. When I reach the point where the next one isn't forming, then uh, the seat of my pants will give way and uh, 
that, that I guess will be it. But you see, I've written uh, the the one that is latest one that's not been published yet. Uh, I've been rather slow in writing that, mainly because of the pandemic, and it's been very hard to get motivated while we've had lockdowns and so forth. But while I've been writing the next one, which is about a, an archaeological site, I've been developing thoughts on the next one, and I've got the next book all planned out. I know who the main characters are, I know what the action is, and I know who uh, the murderer is. Uh, so it is not, and it's not quite seat in of pants, but it's uh, sort of uh, next stage on. Yeah. Well, and it, does it always work out the way you picture it at the beginning? Like, so when you've got the picture of, let's say, when you were doing Secret Death and you kind of get the idea of the characters and what's going to happen, does it, does it always sort of end up the way you think it would? Oh, with one exception. Again, so there's always exceptions, and I think that if you're a writer, you have to uh, allow for the odd exception. Uh, six of the seven books I've written and five of the six that have been published, I always knew who did it, who the, who the murderer was. I always had the, and the, the basic ending planned, if not the exact ending. Uh, and in fact, publishers of crime novels will tell you, because I've talked to them, uh, but they will tell you that they like to know that you've got who the murderer is. A lot of would-be writers who've never been published send manuscripts to the publishers, but they hold back the final chapter where the killer is revealed because they don't want to give their secret away. Uh, they could be pinched by some other author. Well, publishers don't like that. If they get, say, three chapters, they'll say, well, we want to know how it ends because they've found so very often crime writers and probably other writers as well start writing, but they've no idea how the book is ever going to finish. So so they get halfway through, and then they're completely stuck, and they can't finish the book off because they've no idea how to finish it. So I think, on the whole, it's very important to know how it finishes. The one exception I had uh, was a book uh, that's uh, called Holy Murder, and it's featured in uh, Boston, in Lincolnshire, which, as I always say to Americans, is the real Boston. It's the, <laughs> it, it, it's the town that the Boston in America was named after. Uh, and because a, lo a lot of people fled religious persecution in here, and they set off from Boston. It wasn't just Plymouth, they set off from Boston. And so um, I set a book there, and I had got an idea of the start of it from an incident I'd seen. I'd seen a friend go upsiling down a church tower. And I thought, suppose, I mean, I wouldn't dare do that. I can't stand heights. I couldn't have done that. <laughs> but I thought, supposing the, somebody tumbled with a strap and it broke and he fell to his death, wouldn't that be a murder story? And the great thing about Boston uh, in Lincolnshire, it has a very high tower. It's, well, it's known as the stump. It's, it's a famous tower. It's known as the stump because it can be seen for, uh, right out to sea. And sailors coming into when Boston was a port uh, could, could spot, the, spot the tower and, and head for it. You can see it for miles around. So it's a famous tower, so I thought this would be a good thing. And I started writing that story because I got the idea of the murder, and I hadn't got the idea of the murderer. And I got part way through, and a friend of mine had actually said, Will you use my name in the book? So I named a character after her. And part way through the book, I suddenly thought, I can make her the, I can make her the murderer because it works. I, it, her being the murderer, it works. So I went, I went ahead and did that. But otherwise, I think it is important you should know where the story is finishing before you start writing it. So are you the type of um, writer that... Um the emotions of the time and what's surrounding you affect the way you write? Not normally, no. Uh, th this was a, a one-off thing, re really. I, I just started feeling lethargic and just can, couldn't get on with it at all. 
Uh, and normally, I do get on with the book because the way I work, if I start writing it and I'm not sure where that takes me, I, but I've got another idea for later in the book, I'll write that later chapter uh, rather, than, rather than stop. I think that if you sort of take it all chronologically, chapter by chapter, and you get stuck, then you're just not going to get anything written. So I normally go on with another chapter. I got an idea, I write it all out. Sometimes it's very messy. You sometimes find that the chapters don't mesh together and you do have to sort them out. But I find that that is much better because you get on with the story. What you do tend to, ha to end up with, if you write the chapters out of order, is, is that action A has to come before B and action B has to come before C. But then you find that C has to come before A. And somehow you've got to square the triangle, as it were. So it can be messy, but I, I normally find I can always write. There's always something to write because I've got plenty of ideas. And sometimes if you write later in the story, you get a better idea for something that's at the start of the story. So it, it normally isn't a, a, a problem with me, but the pandemic was something that uh, none of us have lived our lives through, and I hope never to live through that again. Yeah, yeah. Well, if you're old like Dave, he was yeah. around the very first one, 100 years ago. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, he's, 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 he's been through both. So, you know, still still kicking, you know. Um, right. Now, it, when, when you look at your characters, how much of yourself do you think goes in characters? And do you pick a, you know, it's like, for, for instance, your inspector, Paul Amos, is he you in essence some of him is me he tries to be fair to his staff and when i was an editor i always tried to be fair to the staff and to try to treat people differently uh, but i didn't model him on me there are, there are some aspects of me that goes into him but there are aspects of other people i know uh, go go into him as well i'm not sure uh, but perhaps uh, I'm, I'm not arrogant enough, uh, but I wouldn't like to base a, an entire character on me. I don't think that, uh, that I'm as interesting as that or as exciting as, as that. Uh, so, no, it, it's part of me. There are bits of me that go into it. Um, and, and there are bits of other people I know go into my characters and, uh, and some, some into Paul Amos. Uh, I, I suppose I did start off writing him a bit as me because I know me best and it's always good when you're writing to write about things that you know, whether you're writing a newspaper or magazine article or doing a radio broadcast or writing a novel, uh, you write about things that you know best because you write best. So there is a bit of, there is a bit of me in him. In fact, the the character's name was suggested by my wife, who many years ago uh, had a teacher, an English teacher called Paul Amos, and uh, we quite liked the name. It's short, it's, it's sort of equal, uh, four letters in each. It's a bit like my name, Rodney Hobson, six letters in each. It runs off rather nicely. And uh, the original Paul Amos, uh, who's the teacher, has uh, since died, uh, but he was a nice bloke, so I thought we'll have a nice detective, and uh, we'll we'll have a we'll have a nice bloke out of him. Uh, so I never actually met the original Paul Amos, so it's certainly not based on him. If his uh, if any of his descendants are listening, uh, it was not based <laughs> on him. Honest, uh, I know. Don't sue I know, you. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 well, I know he has children and grandchildren. The original Paul Amos, but I sort of wanted to go for. I wanted to go for a, a, an ordinary sort of person because most people are fairly ordinary. You get so many detectives who were sort of super efficient and super clever and just out of this world, but they can never run their own private lives. They always have a rebellious daughter or they get drunk or that sort of thing. <laughs> this, this flawed detective... Uh, that's the, the brilliant fraud detective. It's, it's been done so often. I wanted to have a detective who was interesting 
but it was a real person. It was somebody that you might know. So by making him normal, I didn't want to make him uninteresting. I, want, I wanted him to, to feel he was normal. And the people would think, yes, I know that sort of person. It's a real person. So in the same token, are you um, taking people that you don't like and they're the one people that get killed <laughs> in your book? Uh, I did. I did on one. <laughs> I, I, one. One person is is actually clearly recognizable. I have to say that this person won't sue me. I was quite satisfied on that because he was quite an unpleasant character in many ways, and I think he would be flattered at his betrayal. So, so I, I think he, I, I think he'd be quite pleased with it in a, in a, in a way. But the, the I have a magistrate who, who was based on someone I know, but he's a fairly minor character. On the whole, I don't place people in, in books. I don't, on the whole, kill off people. I don't like. There was just the one exception, and I allowed myself that indulgence. Was that your father-in-law? <laughs> oh, no, actually. <laughs> uh, no, actually, my father-in-law was also a teacher, and I have to say, he was a really nice bloke, and some of him is in Paul Amos. Some, some of my father-in-law is, is, is in Paul Amos. Now, I got on very well with him. Now, I wouldn't have wanted to kill, kill him off, and... Uh, Yes, so a bit of me, but probably more more of uh, my father-in-law in it in Paul Amos than than there is of me. Hmm. Now, do do you always, or you know, perhaps have a uh, a subtext or some sort of a point that you want readers to get out of the book that's laying underneath the entertainment of the story, and it might happen organically or it might be planned. Is, is there some sort of meaning? Uh, I like to stick odd comments in that will make people think. It's not so much a subplot, particularly, as being uh, just something that makes you think, or a little touch of humour, a nice little joke that, that I slip in. On the whole, I've gone down the route of trying to do the book based on it's the whodunits, and so the main thing is the plot, and the main thing is how you work out who did it. I know that a lot of modern crime now is more psychological thrillers, so you have this real depth behind them and you give people nightmares, which is not my intention. So there isn't that much of it. I feel that there's always a place for whodunits, that people have loved them right from the time of going back to Sherlock Holmes all the way through Agatha Christie. Uh, Ruth Rendell was another who was a whodunit. Uh, and so there's always call for whodunits. And people who write this deeper and this subplot and substrata and the complex stories, um, those sort of things are leave to people who specialize in that. I mean, there's there's other plot lines in the story in that you have to have some red, herring, red herrings, you have to have some leads that you follow that take you down the wrong track. So they're in there mainly to, to make the story difficult to solve. They're not there really as, as a device in themselves. Interesting. You know, you mentioned uh, earlier writing out of order. Uh, and I'm just wondering, uh, you know, because that can, you know, like you say, get kind of messy. I do it myself. Mm. Do you have any tools that you use to keep yourself organized? I, I know I use a program called Scrivener to kind of move everything around. It, do, do you use a tool or are you using uh, mainly just like a, a, a word or, or something like that to, um, to keep your writing organized? No, I still believe that the human brain is superior to all these computer programs. Mm. And... <laughs> And I sort it out myself. What I tend to do is write chapters, even though they, if, if there's gaps, get, get pretty much to the end of the book and then start again and start writing it through and sorting it out. But what I also do, and I again, we're going down the human route, I always have at least four people and preferably six 
who read the manuscript when I finish the first revise and go through it, and I say to them, I mean, I know a lot of authors just want to be flattered, but I mm -hmm. don't. I say to them, I want to know what's wrong. I want you to pick up things that I've got wrong. And it's not just typing errors. You very often find you've changed somebody's name halfway through mm. the book. It's very easily, it's very easily done. You sometimes got a piece of action that doesn't match in chapter three and chapter 12. Uh, you may have a place, something that happens in one place that later on you had it happening in another place. It's very easy to do it. So I think however you write, you need somebody to go through and try and pick up this. And it is funny that I found that one person will pick up something and the other three or four who've read it miss that. But mm, the others right. pick up, they, they pick up something that I've missed. And so I think that having human beings and having people who act as readers going through the books and checking it and telling you where it goes wrong is vital. You see, the, the problem is, I mean, either Arthur Conan Doyle with the Sherlock Holmes stories, I suppose nobody dared say to him, you've made a mistake here. And they're, they're full of slapdash errors. I mean, at mm. one point, you know, Dr. Watson, Dr. Watson's wife gets his first name wrong. Wow. Can you believe it? Yes. There's, <laughs> uh, the, and, but there's, there's other things like that. So, so don't be so arrogant that you think you can't make these sort of mistakes. But I prefer the human brain to go through it because you see it as a human being. They see it as a reader would and they tell you what doesn't work and what does work and doesn't work. And sometimes, you see, you find that you think, well, I understand that. Well, of course, you do understand that. But somebody else... It doesn't come across to them. I had, uh, on this book that uh, I'm about to have published next, uh, someone raised an issue. And I, my first reaction, you know, you stupid idiot. Of course, it's blindingly <laughs> obvious. And I thought, well, when the second person queried it, you think, no, hang on, I'm the bl blithering idiot. I've not explained <laughs> this properly. I've not got this across. So, uh, yes, you, ha you do need the human beings to do it. And no computer program, as far as I'm concerned, could ever get around that. It's good advice. Yeah, so you better take that. I will. Yeah, I, I have. <laughs> that wasn't meant I personally. Am right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, research. Uh, do you find that you have to do a lot of research to to put together a detective like this, like police procedurals and things like that? Yes, this is a really difficult one. Because if you get too bogged down with doing things that absolutely as they would be, I don't think you'd have much of a story. I'm sure most police work, as most other work, is sort of chores and doing things, routine things. Even the most exciting story you work on, there's a lot of routine involved in it. Uh, so you can take this idea of authenticity too far. On the other hand, if you are a bit too lax with authenticity and you do write things that are very obviously wrong, then people are going to pull you up on it and you're going to, you know, people will be, will be turned off. So I do do some research. I set my stories in the 1990s. I did that because the trouble with the DNA and CCTV now is it takes a lot of the who done it away. It's all part of police procedural now. So I wanted to go back not too far so that people could remember those times, but I wanted to go back before you had all these things where you could get a sudden solution. Somebody's DNA is on the knife that's in, stuck in somebody's back. It's not much of a who done it. So I wanted to go back before we had DNAs. But I, I've done research. Now, most, uh, mostly this, the things are set in the uh, city of Lincoln. It's a rather beautiful city, a very photogenic. And if uh, any of your listeners uh, want to come and make a TV series out of it, it will be terrific. <laughs> it will be terrific visuals, I can tell you. Uh, but there are things that have happened there. I have checked back. You suddenly start thinking, see, the police station, the, the police headquarters used to be in the centre of Lincoln. It moved 
to a bigger side just outside. Uh, and I thought, now I must check whether the police were still in the centre of Lincoln or outside, because somebody's going to pick up this if I get it wrong. There also was a station called St. Mark's with a level crossing across the high street, which caused great chaos. In fact, there were two level crossings because there were two railway lines at one stage. And so you could get cars who got caught as a train was coming. They get caught between the two crossings. And so I wanted to know when the second line was removed, because it was at some stage. And also the gates used to swing backwards and forwards. And now level crossing gates on railways go up and down. And I, so I checked when that changed, because it, may, it didn't matter to the story, it didn't make any difference to the story, but you want to get that sort of thing right, you know, because people will, people will pick up on, on, that, on that kind of thing. So I do check those sort of things. I do take a bit of liberty over the police procedures. I think that an inspector would be, in, in a British police station, an inspector would be more answerable to a superintendent. I've cut the superintendent out and I brought the chief constable down a little. He brought him in a bit, whereas he would probably be completely aloof. Uh, but it worked well with the stories and I didn't feel that was cheating too far. So, yes, I go for authenticity when it matters, but I don't let it spoil a good story. Right, right. Now, I, so is Lincoln written uh, the the location as a character? Like, do you develop it just like you do a character? Yes, yes. I mean, a lot, a lot of what is Lincoln is the city itself and the countryside around, because a lot of countryside around, there's seaside nearby, there's industry. So it lends itself very well to a variety. And I... If if it works to go in the centre of Lincoln, I try to stick with that as the location. But if I want to go out of the countryside, I can eas I can easily do it. As I mentioned, I went to Bo down to Boston, which isn't too far from Lincoln. Uh, is it within the same area? We come under the police, same police force. Uh, so I do allow the the location to wander a bit if it's if it suits the story. Uh, so I I think it's best not to be too hidebound. You want some structure to your stories and you want something that you can cling to that's, that links all the stories uh, and, and means something to people. Uh, but don't, don't be hidebound by it. I, I vary it according to what works. Do you find you get the same satisfaction or the same, um, I don't know, just the same feeling when you write a crime fiction book as compared to finance? Ooh, that's, in, that's interesting. That, uh, well, satis yes, I feel great satisfaction. Yes, I enjoy both, and I feel great satisfaction of, of completing the books. So there is no difference there, even though they're different genres, one's fiction and one's non-fiction. Uh, it's uh, one's very heavy factual, whereas the the others much more conversational. I mean, the detective stories are very heavy on dialogue, which of course you you just don't get in the uh, in the investment books. Uh, it, but the satisfaction is still the same. I still enjoy writing. I've always enjoyed writing. I've done it all my life, and I've always enjoyed writing, and I get the same pleasure from doing it. And I get the same pleasure from developing and seeing how the book develops and the same pleasure from completing it and the same pleasure from getting it published. Uh, it's, yes, the, the, the books are different. The pleasure is the same. Was it, was it an easy transition um, to go from writing nonfiction, investment uh, nonfiction, or, uh, to fiction? Or was that a little bit more difficult to go to creative I writing? I, I, I didn't. I didn't find it difficult. No, uh, that that wasn't a problem. I. I mean, I think it depends on the individual author what you enjoy doing. And some authors like writing fiction. Some write nonfiction. Some authors like writing short stories, for example, which I've tried and um, can't really get into. 
I mean, I don't like really long books. I don't like running to 80,000 words or more. And mine run to about 43 to, to 50,000. And I think that was, I think that is enough. Uh, so, so there are types of book I wouldn't write. I wouldn't write really long ones. I wouldn't write short ones, but I found I didn't have a difficulty in, in, in doing, in doing both. No, it, it, it worked, it worked out fine. But if I started writing something and it just didn't, I mean, I wouldn't start writing poetry, for example. I'm no good at it. <laughs> so, so yes, there are some things I just wouldn't do. But I, in this case, I'd always been interested in detective story. I, I read a lot of, I read all the Sherlock Holmes stories. I read a lot of Agatha Christie when I was in my teens. Uh, I've read some um, American uh, detective stories. And I, I've always enjoyed detective fiction i think is in some ways it's a sort of escape from real life i mean it's funny to think somebody getting killed is a pleasant escape from real life but uh, it, since it's only well, a, nowadays <laughs> well, well since it's since it's only, in my case it's only a story uh, i don't that that's fair enough it, it, it is it is an escape and uh, mm. so i i i just enjoy the escape what do you think the difference is between um, American and English um, crime or, or, you know, these types of books, detective books? Well, one big difference I found, I'm, I'm going to be very careful here not to offend all your American listeners. <laughs> I, I, one thing I found with American books, you den, do tend to have the real big successful uh, there was people who were at the top of their top of the tree they're all brilliant the uh, and most people aren't aren't brilliant but you you get somebody if you say if he's somebody is in computer into computers he runs a computer company because he does, knows more about computers than anybody else and he's all brilliant or if he went to uh, I, I started reading an American book, and I can't even remember the title, because he said this guy was the most brilliant student his school had ever had, except for his elder <laughs> sister, who was the most brilliant student uh, that, that had ever gone to Yale. And I thought, no, hang on, hang on a minute. If the story can't carry it, then then... Let's not do it just on the most brilliant person. Most people are ordinary, and most ordinary people are very interesting. And I'm, gr I'm a great believer in the idea everybody's got a novel in them. Everybody's life was a story. And so I think that ordinary people make great stories. And that's the one thing that I don't like about American fiction. You do tend to have these people who are just plain brilliant. Perhaps it makes me feel inferior. Yeah, well, you know, that's, <laughs> yeah. that's, uh, that's you know, the American way. And, uh, I did have an American friend who came over here. He, he, he married an English uh, nurse, in fact, and they came back over, over here. And he always enjoyed saying to people at work, uh, well, this isn't how we do things in America, and things are always bigger in, 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 in America. And he couldn't understand why his work colleagues didn't greatly like him. But, <laughs> but, but, but we kept in touch with him, and I was delighted to say that we, I discovered that when he went back to America and got a job in America, he told all his colleagues, oh, this isn't how we did things in England. We did things much better in England. <laughs> so, so, so I took some satisfaction in that. Yeah, well, you know, that's how it goes. Now, one book. Someone has never heard of you before, which I find very hard to believe, but someone's just come across the show, and you have one book that, you, that they, they want to get to find out who you are as a writer. Which book would you suggest they get? Well, the, the detective book that I enjoyed most uh, was the second one I wrote, which is called Unlikely Graves. I thought it was the best title, and I think in many ways it was the mo most intricate of the books, and it was the one I got most satisfaction writing. And one or two people on uh, Amazon have put in comments and, and they've said they thought that was the best one. So if you're going to start with anyone, 
Start with, start with unlikely graves. I I, I like that, st- that story. Do 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 the um, reviews and people's comments and social media and that whole thing. Does that sort of um, mean a lot to you? Do you follow through with all that? I like to see what people have said. I think you learn things. If you get complaints or people criticize you, you can learn from the criticisms. You do have to learn to take the rough with the smooth. You do have to understand that not everybody is going to like your books and you're going to have some comments. On the whole, I've not been trolled. and People haven't gone on... I hope people don't listen to this and then go on and troll me. But... Well, we're going to promote, <laughs> tell them to. So. <laughs> well, no, but uh, um, I've, I've, I've had very few really stinging comments and none, none that have been downright personally unpleasant. So I got off fairly lightly on that. But sometimes you do get exasperated. And I've learned to... to uh, to, to laugh at them. Now, you, you asked me which book I would choose. Now, if I was talking about the investment books, I would undoubtedly uh, take Shares Made Simple because I, it's, that's for beginners and I think that does most good. And it's now been gone into a third edition. I'm about to write a fourth edition. And that's it. But that book is called Shares Made Simple. And the subtitle is A Beginner's Guide to the Stock Market. And someone uh, on Amazon put a, a one-star review and said, this book is very simple. It's, su- <laughs> it's suitable only for beginners. I thought, well, you didn't have to buy the book. You could have just read the cover. Uh, and, and the, but but when I, when I, I learned to laugh at that. I said, but another one that I particularly enjoyed uh, was someone, and I can't even remember which book it was, but someone said, halfway through this book, I lost the will to live. But, <laughs> but, ah, but what I really enjoyed about it was, she gave it two stars out of five. And I thought, if you lost the will to live halfway through, why haven't you given me one star? There must have been, <laughs> there must have been something about the book she liked. Oh, no, when she stabbed herself, she fell on it, and it hit two <laughs> stars by accident. That was just an accident. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 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 See, you have to take it. I mean, sometimes <laughs> people say very nice things, and I'm, I'm any human, and I do enjoy it when people praise the books and say they got something out of it. Of course, I greatly enjoy it, I greatly enjoy it but at the same time, maybe if somebody criticizes it, Maybe they maybe they're right. I mean, they bought the book. They're entitled to their criticism, and maybe I can do better next time. Yeah, or maybe you won't. <laughs> oh no, I will. I most certainly will. Well, you know, you can't win. So now let's let's talk about how do people um, get a hold of you? You've got a website. You've got which social media do you like to be on? Um, I'm, I'm I'm on Twitter. I comment in, on Twitter. I comment mainly on the uh, finance books, but I have now started. Uh, I've got linked in with a group of other writers, and I've started commenting uh, on there because uh, about the detective books. Because I think writers is a very lonely place to be in. You you're not going into an office every day. You're writing it at home, most people are writing at home, and uh, mm. you wonder how you're getting on, you wonder if, am I the only one who's got self-doubt, am I the only one who can't get this chapter moving, am I the only one who does this, that and the other, so it's great to group together, and I try to put in encouraging comments to other people, because I, I know what a great thrill it is to get published, I know what a great thrill it is just to complete the story, even if it doesn't get published, so I like to encourage other people to do it, and if anybody wants to come on to my Twitter account, uh, which is uh, Rodney Hobson, at Rodney Hobson, uh, do by all means come on, and I'll try to give you I'll try to give you some encouragement. Let's we're all in this world to to help each other. Uh, if you if you want to contact me, certainly if you put my name into your search engine, it should come up. Uh, there is another Rodney Hobson. He runs karate classes. That's, <laughs> that is not me. 
so so don't get in touch with him. He might chop you up. Uh, yeah, right. Whereas if you get in touch with me, I might chop you up in a book, but not in real life. Yeah. Well, you know. And uh, your <laughs> website. What's your website? The website is Rodney Hobson at co.uk. That's great. Now we're going to have all that up for people that can find you with one click when they listen. Yes. And please, please, and do. please, yeah, and troll, uh, troll all you can. Uh, uh, no, right. please, <laughs> well, please, no, please, e please email me. I do respond to all emails. It may take a little while. I'm sure you have so many uh, listeners to this podcast that I'm going to get flooded out with emails. So it may take a little time, but please do email me. I do respond. And I do like to talk to people in other countries and uh, anywhere around the world. So do get in touch. Yeah, everyone. Give, just drop it on them. Um, so you, I was going to say, too, now, you, you mentioned that. So you don't really get um, a writer's block then ever, do you? Uh, uh, well, I mean, sometimes, yes, I get stuck. Oh, yes, I can't deny. Sometimes I get stuck. And it's usually when I'm tired as well. Sometimes I say I write an investment column uh, every week and I try to write it. I start to try to start writing it on the Monday and finish it on the Tuesday for publication on the Wednesday. Because, yes, you can get stuck. And if you get tired, it's very hard to write if you feel tired. Sometimes you need a good night's sleep and get refreshed in the morning. So I do sometimes get stuck. But as I say, my idea of getting rounded is you get on with something else. You may find your brain has worked on the problem that got you stuck in the meantime. And you come back to it and you see things in a completely fresh light. And you get going again. I think the people who get writer's block are the ones who stop and say, I'm going to write the next sentence next. And they never get that sentence written. Great off and write something else. Come back to it later. How long does it take you to do one of these crime books? Uh, well, uh, as I said, the last one took me two years. But normally, uh, normally uh, about six months. Uh, I write... A f the first draft, uh, it probably has holes in it, it probably has contradictions in it. I go through and at least once, possibly twice, and often it in, does involve quite a bit of rewriting and get it complete. Then I put it out to, uh, say, at least four people, preferably six, and take their comments back, and then I go right back to the beginning and work through it again and deal with all the points that they've raised. And although just occasionally I say, no, I'm going to ignore that, on the whole, I take note of nearly everything that people say because they raise good points and they see it as a reader. And if one reader raises an issue, then other readers are going to read it. So I then go through all, all that and it takes them a bit of time to read and come back. So I would say a book usually about, it usually takes about six months, but then I will have a break. I, I don't just keep writing the books one after the other. Oh, that's interesting. Well, it's been a real pleasure here. Um, we've really enjoyed having you on the show. And, uh, well, hopefully you'll be back when you write a new book and, uh, and uh, anytime you want to give us financial advice so we can retire. You know? Yes. Um, <laughs> now, of course, <laughs> the book we're talking about, Secret Death, our, our author is Rodney Hobson. Thank you for being here. It's been a great pleasure to talk to you. I've really enjoyed it. Thanks, Rodney. Tired of wasting time trying to decide what to watch on your streaming service? Go to our website and look for the Martino Movie Reviews. You've been listening to the House of Mystery radio show. To find out more about our guests, hosts, or shows, go to www.houseofmystery.com. Show's over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Well, good night. This has been a production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back.